Welcome to the special <laughs> recording of a talk about the Royal Asiatic Society Bicentenary Tour of Lieutenant Colonel James Todd's Rajasthan, which we're just at the tail end of. An introduction to the RAS and its bicentenary um, will be given by Dr. Allison Ota, director of the RIS, and followed by a description of the itinerary by Dr. Elizabeth Driver, who organized the trip and did a marvelous job of leading us to some magical places. Over to you, Allison. Well, greetings from Jodhpur. Here I am with Liz and Melinda, uh, and we've just spent, as she's told you, two weeks in Rajasthan, following in the footsteps of James Todd, visiting places and people that he describes in his book, The Annals and Antiquities of Rajasthan. Uh, Liz planned the tour and led it, and together with Melinda, they have put together a short presentation of the highlights of our journey. Um, the three uh, volumes of um, Todd's Annals and Antiquity uh, Annals and Antiquities will be published in the late summer uh, in conjunction with the Yale University Press. This publication is part of the bicentenary celebrations that and the RAS commissioned uh, this volume. It's a limited edition reissue of the Annals and Antiquities uh, with a companion volume by Norbert Peabody. It returns uh, the text to the original state and provides the reader uh, with the necessary apparatus and background to understand this important work. It is full of wonderful illustrations and a very useful and interesting map. Liz, over to you. Hello, everyone. I thought I ought to start by trying to explain why Todd is still so highly regarded in Rajasthan. Now, I was really struck by this when I came in October, and again this time. In fact, in the lift in the first hotel, I was going off to give the first of my little talks to the group, and a lady noticed I was carrying a copy of Todd's Annals of Rajasthan, and said, oh, I read that at school. It's wonderful, isn't it? So I thought that was an encouraging start. But I think to understand this, you you need to look back to what all the problems were in the region in the late 18th and early 19th century. And there are at least three strands to this. The first is that there were wars going on continuously with the Bharatas. So that's the people directly to the east of Rajasthan, which were very successful on the part of the Bharatas in the main and doing a great deal of damage to the Rajputs. Secondly, there were raids going on by the Pindaris, who were cattle stealers, um, thieves. They weren't interested in settling anywhere. They just came and raided and went away again. And actually, in some ways, perhaps even the most important of the three problems was that there was a great deal of internecine fighting between the local rulers within Rajasthan and indeed between the rulers and their senior henchmen who were the local landowners. But the upshot of all these three problems was that there was a loss of, of land and of assets of all kinds leading to extreme poverty. No agriculture was taking place because of all the wars that were going on and commerce equally couldn't function. So that's the state of affairs that Todd found when he arrived in this area for the first time in 1799. I think one of the, the reasons why Todd was very successful, at least initially, as the political agent of the East India Company, was that he was able to offer protection from particularly the Maharatas and the Pindaris as part of the treaties negotiated between the local rulers and the East India Company. But in addition, because of the mutual respect between Todd and the rulers, he was able to achieve much more than a merely formal political solution to the, the problems and was able to negotiate between the rulers and their subjects and between the different rulers to produce 
peace. And with that, of course, came prosperity. And that is remembered. It's remembered by the, the Rajput families to this day. So that's a bit of background. I think the other bit of background that we need, if I could have the next slide, please. I just need to explain that initially Todd was not attached to the Rajput courts, but rather to one of the Maratha courts, that of Sindhya, who later settled in Gwalior. And because this court was peripatetic, this gave Todd the opportunity to survey the terrain and create a very detailed map of the area. He was clearly a very expert surveyor. And in addition to creating the map, he was also able to pick up intelligence about local allegiances. And both of these things proved extremely useful to the East India Company in the Maratha Wars, which they ultimately won. Could I have the next slide, please? The, uh, the very first of the visits that we made is actually not described in the annals of Rajasthan because it predates the annals by quite a long period. It goes back to 1807. And this was a period when Todd had begun to negotiate treaties with the local Rajput rulers. And he'd been working extremely hard and decided that he just wanted a moment to himself. And so he went off riding his horse. And uh, he describes the what then happened in quite funny terms in a, a later document. He says, he's writing about himself in the third person. In 1807, when the author, then commencing his career, was wandering alone through their country, surveying their geography and collecting scraps of their statistics, he left Sindhya battering Rathgore and with a slender guard proceeded through the wilds of Chanderi and thence direct westwards to trace the course of all the rivers lying between the Betwa and the Chambal. In passing through Haruti, so this is getting close to the outskirts of Kota, about 30 miles to the east of Kota, leaving his tent standing at Barra, he'd advanced as far as the Kali Sind, a distance of 17 miles, and leaving his people to follow at leisure, was returning home unattended at a brisk canter, when, as he passed through the town of Bamolia, a party rushed out and made him captive saying he must visit the chief. Although much fatigued, it would have been folly to refuse. He obeyed and was conveyed to a square in the centre of which was an elevated chibutra or platform shaded by the sacred tree. Here, sitting on carpets, was the chief with his little court. The author was received most courteously. The first act was to disembarrass him of his boots, but this, heated as he was, they could not effect. Refreshments were then put before him, and a Brahmin brought water with a urine basin for his ablutions. Although he was then but an indifferent linguist, their putt was scarcely intelligible to him. He passed a very happy hour in which conversation never flagged. And you can see on here the, uh, a little picture which the current Maharaja had done of on the Chabutra, they have by this time succeeded in getting his boots off. And uh, on mm -hmm. the left is Maharaja Abhimanyu Singh of Bamolia with his daughter, and they're, they're holding the, uh, the painting that he commissioned. So we had wonderful hospitality and conversation never flagged, and we stayed more than an hour, so it was absolutely delightful. The rest of the places that we visited are all described in the, the annals of Rajasthan, and they cover a later period from 1819 to 1822. Could I have the next slide, please? We went from there to Udaipur. This, this city was Todd's base for the whole of this period from which he set out on three separate journeys, which he describes in the personal narratives of the annals. But oddly, he doesn't actually offer very much description of Udaipur. I think maybe it was just too familiar 
to him to, uh, to interest him in writing about it. But what's really clear is the close relationship that uh, he had with the then Rana Bim Singh, whom he saw frequently in both formal audiences and in, in less formal settings. This photograph shows our group with the staff of the, the charitable foundation of the Maharana of Mawar, so the successor to Bim Singh. And they organized a, a wonderful session with descriptions of Todd's journeys and then showed us around the museum. So another lovely meeting. Next slide, please. When Todd returned from the first of his journeys, he camped just outside Udaipur, waiting for it to be auspicious for Bim Singh to come and welcome him formally back into Udaipur. And he camped quite close to the, the royal cenotaphs at a place called Aha, which this photograph shows. There are hundreds of them. And Todd does comment that there are so many because they're not all royal. And he says rather nicely, I thought that in, in death as they had been in life, the Rajput rulers did not separate themselves from their subjects. Mm -hmm. And so you have this crowded cemetery of people from the upper echelons of society, of course, but not just the ruling families as you normally get in sets of cenotaphs. And the next slide, please. The first mention of this bungalow is at the same time as Todd visited Aha when he was waiting for the Rana. And he tells us that while they were waiting, they amused themselves by chalking out the site of their projected residence. And he describes it on the heights of twos. Well, it's taken a lot of tracking down, um, but with a lot of help from the, the palace in Udaipur, we are pretty convinced that this building shown in the photographs is indeed the, the bungalow that Todd was building for himself. In subsequent descriptions in the annals, he describes the garden that he'd planted in very enthusiastic terms, saying how he had taken peach stones from, from Gwalior, planted them in the orchard where he was camping in the middle of Udaipur, and then planted the little trees out at this bungalow that he was building. He clearly intended to stay near Udaipur, but unfortunately his superiors decided otherwise, I think for a variety of reasons, some of which we'll touch on. And he was retired on the grounds of ill health as it was put and of course so often is even today. Next slide. The next slide shows a throne in the garden of the maidens, Sahili and Kibari. And this garden, with a little pavilion in it was lent to Todd by the Queen of Bundi. We'll come to her in a moment. And it's there that uh, he did his packing, very extensive packing. Some of the, uh, the artifacts he packed found their way to the Royal Asiatic Society. So we mustn't complain. And it was also there that he said sad farewells to the Rana in June, 1822. <laughs> I'm just going to touch on Chittagar next. Todd was extremely excited at seeing what he called the ancient capital of the Sasodias teeming with reminiscences of glory. And he described the, the victory tower, which we see on the right hand side of this mm -hmm. photograph, and also particularly the, the J in tower which uh, is on the left the victory tower was uh, erected in the in the 15th century according to this i have 16th on when rana kumba who will come to a bit later um managed to defeat the combined armies of malwa and gujarat so that's chitor uh, i'm then going to just digress briefly to talk about opium. Todd was 
were very, very upset about the opium trade. Uh, this came as something of a surprise to me because one, of course, associates the East India Company with encouraging the opium trade. He says, a slight sketch of the introduction and mode of culture of this drug, which has tended more to the physical and moral degradation of the inhabitants than the combined influence of pestilence and war, may not be without interest. He then gives a detailed description of, could I have the next slide please, of the way in which opium was cultivated. The interesting thing about this is that to the methodology which was in use and described by Todd is absolutely identical to the way that it's done today. Todd goes on again in this, in this section saying it is a singular fact that the cultivation of opium increased in the inverse ratio of general prosperity and that as war, pestilence and famine augmented their virulence and depopulated Rajputana, so did the culture of this baneful weed appear to thrive. He really has nothing, nothing good to say about it. He concludes on opium by saying, such is the history, and I believe a pretty correct one, of the growth and extension of this execrable and demoralizing plant for the last 40 years. So that's from the 1780s onwards. And this is the very interesting bit. If the now paramount power, so that's the British in the form of the East India Company, instead of making a monopoly of it and consequently extending its cultivation, would endeavour to restrict it by judicious legislative enact enactments or at least reduce its culture to what it was 40 years ago, generations yet unborn would have just reason to praise us for this work of mercy. It is no less in our interest than our duty to do so and to call forth genuine industry for the improvement of cotton, indigo, sugarcane and other products which would enrich instead of demoralising and therefore impoverishing the country. We've saved Rajputana from political ruin but the boon of mere existence will be valueless if we fail to restore the moral energies of our population. So pretty powerful stuff really. So to get back to, uh, to visits, the next place that we visited was the fort at Begu. You can see on the left the main palace within the fort walls and on the right the extremely pretty but somewhat battered lake palace. The, uh, the Maharaj of Begu told us that he owns eight palaces, uh, all of which were in a full state of repair, so one can't help but feel a little bit sorry for the man. A very funny but almost tragic accident occurred at Begu, which was one of the reasons why I was so keen that we should go there. He writes on the 26th of, of February, we're into 1822 now. The chances were 999 to 1 that I ever touched a pen again. Two days ago, I started, and I thought, this is quite nice. He's, he's self-deprecating for once. With all the pomp and circumstance befitting the occasion to restore to the chief the land of his sires, of which force and fraud had conspired to deprive them during more than 30 years. The purport of my visit being made known the sons of Calameg, this is the locals, assembled from all quarters, but honour has again interfered. The old castle of Begoon has a remarkably wide moat, across which there is a wooden bridge communicating with the town. The avant courtiers of my cavalcade, with an elephant bearing the union, having crossed and passed under the arched gateway, I followed, contrary to the Mahout's advice, who said there certainly would not be space to admit the elephant and howder. But I heedlessly told him to drive on, and if he could not pass through, to dismount. The hollow sound of the bridge and the deep moat on either side alarmed the animal, and she darted forward with all the celerity occasioned by fear, in spite of any effort to stop her. So he's on a bolting elephant approaching a gateway which is not high enough. <laughs> As I approached the gateway, I measured it with my eye 
and the expecting inevitable and instantaneous destruction, I planted my feet firmly against the howder and my forearms against the archway, and by an almost preternatural effort of strength, burst out of the back of the howder. The elephant pursued her flight inside, and I dropped senseless on the bridge below. <laughs> Fortunately, it all ends happily with the Maharaja of Begum picking him up and they have their discussions and he restores Begu to his throne. So that went well in the end, but he was pretty battered. And in fact, it's after that that Todd went to Chittagar and tells us that he was completely unable to, to walk up the steps. Our meeting with the current Maharaja of Begu, Ajay Singhji. Uh, so that's me on the left and Alison on the right, uh, listening politely to the Maharaja. Next slide, please. Our next visit was something entirely different and Pod visited a lot of temples. And certainly initially he was not very enthusiastic about Hindu architecture. But it was at Baroli that he had a something of a conversion. And one can see why, because Todd was a huge admirer of classical architecture, and there are what looked to him like classical elements to this architecture. I think it's completely wrong. They're not. They're pure Hindu. In fact, they're pure Hindu of this area. But that was why he, uh, he was very taken with this. He said, art seems here to have exhausted itself, and we were perhaps now for the first time fully impressed with the beauty of Hindu sculpture. The next visit, if I can have the next slide, please, was to Bundi, and this shows the massive city palace. It also illustrates something about and his relationship with the Rajput rulers, because he was so trusted by the ruler of Bundi that he appointed him guardian to his son, the heir to the throne. And then on the sudden death from cholera of the, the Raja, Todd had to rush to Bundi in a great hurry during the monsoon when he was ill himself. And really rather astonishingly, it was Todd, the Britisher, who conducted the Raj Tilak ceremony, which is the initiation, coronation of, uh, of the child ruler. And if we could have the next slide, please. On the left, you can see the view that you get of the Gaddy from down below. And Todd describes how the courtyard below was absolutely thronged with people watching the ceremony. And then on the right, you can see the actual Gaddy onto which Todd lifted this 11-year-old child and made the tilak mark on his forehead, anointing him as the new ruler of Bundi. After that ceremony, Todd had many discussions with the little boy's mother. And this is another example where Todd's relationship was able to smooth the path to, to peaceful rule for at least a, a good long time. Yes, that's it. Uh, Kota was originally uh, a fiefdom of Bundi, but by the time Todd was involved, it was a separate state in its own right. And there were some hugely complicated political situations going on there involving the regent, a man called Salin Singh who seemed to have uh, an alarmingly close relationship with the Pindaris. Uh, Todd, again, was reasonably successful in sorting out these political problems, but they were still raging when he was obliged to leave Kota, and he left one of his English companions, actually his cousin, a man called Patrick Ward, behind to try and sort it. In fact, this is another situation like Udaipur, where we're not told very much at all about Kota. And the reason for that is because Todd and his companions were all extremely ill for the whole time they were in Kota, around four months, 
with a combination of cholera and malaria, and ultimately the youngest of them, Lieutenant Carey, actually died and is buried back at Tees where the bungalow was. Could we have the next slide, please? Sorry, but yes, all right, let's have that. That's Zalim Singh, who was the regent who was causing Todd a lot of headaches. Yeah, peacefully smoking his hooker, but no doubt plotting something. Todd's Bridge is actually really uh, an extraordinary story. The, uh, it's, a, it's a big road bridge over the Shambal River, which is, uh, uh, you, know, you see it here actually in a photograph taken in October when the, uh, the water was high. And it came about because when the Pindaris were finally defeated, and it tells you in the inscription that this was by a combination of East India Company troops and local troops, the, uh, all the loot which the Pindaris had accumulated was uh, collected up by Zalim Singh. And maybe because he was a bit shifty about his relationship with the Pindaris, he handed the whole lot over to Todd. And Todd used it to build this bridge, which is dedicated to Hastings. So that's Todd's bridge. And then if we can go too forward to Todd's horse. <laughs> <laughs> this is another curiosity. Uh, it's extraordinary that this still exists. Todd was presented with a really splendid horse by Bim Singh of Udaipur. And to everyone's horror, the horse died and was buried in Kota. Todd tells us about this awful event. Bajraj was perfection and so general a favorite that his death was deemed a public misfortune. The general yell of sorrow that burst from all my sepo sepoys and establishment on that event was astounding. And the whole camp attended his obsequies. Many were weeping. And when they began to throw the earth upon the fine beast wrapped in his body clothes, his groom threw himself into his grave and was quite frantic with grief. I cut some locks off his mane in remembrance of the most of the noblest beast I ever crossed. And in a few days, I observed many huge stones near the spot, which before I left Kota grew into a noble altar of hewn stone, about 20 feet square and four feet high, on which was placed the effigy of Bajraj, <laughs> large as life, sculpted out of one block of freestone. And there's Bajraj in the middle of Kota. Quite extraordinary. So the final visit that I'm going to talk to you about is to another of the, the Rajput states, that of Banera. And aside from being a, a truly delightful visit for us, I think Banera provides a really good example of the sort of problems that Todd was facing all over the Rajput states and how his close relationship with the, the rulers enabled him to go a good long way to solving their problems. Let me read you a, a little about it. My friend Raja Bim did me the honour to advance two miles from Banera to welcome and conduct me to his castle. Here I had a good opportunity in the feudal state of these chiefs within their own domains during a visit of three hours at Banera. I was, moreover, much attached to Rana Bim, who was a perfectly well-bred and courteous gentleman, and he was quite unreserved with me. He tells us that the castle of Banera, which you see on the slide here, is one of the most imposing feudal edifices of Mawa, and its lord, one of the greatest of its chieftains. He not only bears the title of Raja, but has all the status insignia attached there too. The velvet cushion was spread in a balcony projecting from the main hall of Banera. Here the, the Raja's vassals were mustered and he placed me by his side on the gaddy. This seems to be something that happens to Todd on quite a number of occasions, that the rulers seem to see him as an equal and a friend. And so he's asked to sit with them on the gaddy. 
And you may recall that right back in 1807, when he went to Pomolia, a similar thing happened, that he was invited onto the Chabutra to sit, to talk with the, the local ruler there. There was not a point of his rural or domestic economy upon which he did not discount and ask my advice as his adopted brother. So again, a close relationship, not just a, a very formal one between British East India Company and local ruler. I was also made umpire between him and my old friend, the Baron of Badnell regarding a marriage settlement. Again, this is something that happens again and again, problems with marriage settlements, problems with claims between chiefs and their vassals. He says, my friend prepared his gifts at parting. I went through the forms of receiving, but waived accepting them, which may be done without any offence to delicacy. I have been highly gratified to read the kind reception he gave to the respected Bishop Haber in his tour through Miroir. So at last we've got a later third party telling us what happened and mm. how respected Pod was at that point. My friend accompanied me to my tent when I presented to him a pair of pistols and a telescope with which he might view his neighbours on the mountains. We parted with mutual satisfaction and, I believe, mutual regret. Well, we had a three-hour visit to Bonaire as well, and we parted with mutual regret. But in October, I had asked the Raja whether it would be possible to see the pistols which Todd had given his ancestor. And he said, well, I'm sorry, you can't see them today because they're in an armory, but I'll try and get them for next time you visit. So he very rapidly told us on this visit that something awful had happened and that the pistols which had been taken away into the armory of the local police station at Bilwara had been found to have disappeared. He doesn't know quite when, uh, could be a while ago or could be pretty recently, but in any event, the, uh, they're gone. And so we were asked if we would be kind enough to comment to the local press. And we were gratified to see that there have been several articles in the local press describing the loss of the pistols and the regret of the Royal Asiatic Society about that. So I shall end there. We, uh, we will continue our travels. If I can just have the, the last two slides at Banera. This is the, uh, a painting of part of the royal family in the 18th and early 19th century. And then the next slide is us meeting the, the current Raja and, and his relatives in the drawing room of the old palace in the fort. And then finally, next slide, please. This is just the, uh, the flyer for the, the new edition of the Annals and Antiquities of Rajasthan. And if anyone is interested, the contact details are there to get in touch with Alison. So thank you very much for listening. And, uh, we'll try and update you on the last few visits. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Liz. Um, it's been a fantastic trip. They're both too modest to say it, but this has exceeded everyone's expectation. It's been really great, and you'll be hearing more about it um, as more of these bicentennial activities roll out. Thanks to all, to all of you.